Okay, today is what? Thursday, May 6th. Uh, so we'll, we can start office hours. Uh, hopefully you guys have some good questions or things you want to talk about today. Because uh, you know, life just goes on here, you know, day in, day out, week in, week out, it all seems to be the same. So there's a good chance this will be much like last week's office hours. Uh, we, are we, are we not, are we not exciting enough for you, Paul? Is this what the problem is this, here? This is the highlight of my week. Oh, man. I, I don't want to downplay it. You know, I, I look forward to this. Uh, it's just, I sometimes feel like I'm not living up to your expectations by having you know, exciting new things to talk about. Um, I feel we're not looking up to your expectations by not having appropriate questions. So it's, uh, as long as you're showing up, you know, that's, that's, that's good for me. Uh, we have we have the the now <laughs> weekly because this gives me something to do. Uh, PFAS update. Uh, not that I don't have anything to do, but um, but something to present to you. Uh, the weekly PFAS update. I'm uh, I'm gonna have to go back and look because I'm taking these numbers off of a uh, internal database presentation. You know, what do they call dashboard? Uh, and sometimes I think that the numbers are going backwards. Uh, so I have to, to see that we're, it's actually continuing to make progress and like the results received. I could have sworn last week we had more than 77. Uh, but this is what we're seeing in the uh, dashboard today. Uh, still, you know, 80, 90% less than 10 parts per trillion, 96%. Uh, less than 20 parts per trillion. We have 4% that are greater than 20, which are, you know, again, the numbers are still kind of small. So that, that means a total of three hits above 20 parts per trillion um, in the private well sampling. Uh, the public well sampling is going on uh, as well. And they're, you know, they're, they're starting to get into the smaller and smaller public water supplies. The um, that had later dates for, for actually doing the sampling. Uh, so while we were running kind of probably less than 10% of the larger public water supplies having hits greater than 20 parts per trillion, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, uh, you know, that, that says nothing as you look at smaller and smaller public water supplies, you know, it may change, you may see uh, different uh, hit rates uh, for that. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, it will be interesting to see as you we move towards uh, the smaller community public water supplies and then the the non transient non community supplies and eventually the um, the transient non community supplies have to do a round of sampling as well uh, so mm -hmm. you know eventually the all of the public water supplies will be will be sampled and we'll have a really good idea of what's going on out there. Uh, in addition to the, the private wells. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other work, you know, in other other programs beside wayside cleanup and the drinking water program uh, on PFAS, you know, you pretty much can't avoid it uh, these days. Uh, so, you know, more on, on those as uh, they become more available. Uh, so that's, that's PFAS. Um, the we had our last Thursday, <clears throat> we gave you the heads up that the TAG meeting was going to happen that night, and it did um, from seven to eight. Uh, you can still catch it on, on YouTube. Uh, and uh, it went pretty well. We had about 30 or so non-DEP uh, folks attending. Oh, that's a crowd. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a, a, a I think um, it was a good, Kind of a good crowd, kind of what we were hoping for. We, um, you know, you know, more is not always better because it, um, uh, you know, we were afraid of getting Zoom bombs because we had spread the uh, the uh, login instructions far and wide to try to to reach as many people as possible. Um, but so we didn't get overwhelmed by people there just uh, to for the fun of it. Uh, and the people there that did attend had some good questions. They you know, had kind of a good understanding of you know, 
in general, the Wayside Cleanup Program, the, the tag grant and the intricacies of kind of the application process and combines and kind of how, all how that grant making and grant awarding stuff works. Um, you know, that was the purpose of the meeting to introduce them to, to that and uh, kind of help all, everybody along in the process to make sure they have the, the tools to apply, the information to apply. And so, so far so good on that. Uh, I, I think the, it should be going out. Uh, what was the date, Liz? Do you, do you recall it was in a, one, one of the slides? Uh, I think um, towards the end Nancy, of May. Nancy can correct me if I'm wrong, but I- Oh, there's Nancy. Yeah, Nancy, do you know the, the date? Sorry, the day for what? Oh, uh, the, for the, 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 the release? The grants posted. Yep. Uh, May 19th. May 19th. May 19th. Okay, so another week or so. Okay. Sorry for my, <laughs> I'm not looking too good this morning. Um, May 19th, and then the application deadline is uh, July 16th. Yeah. Okay. 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 And in other grant news, we we are expecting the Mosper grant uh, announcement uh, pretty soon, pretty, pretty, pretty soon, closer than it was last week. Um, I think it's in absolutely the final stage of approval. So I uh, always like giving away money. Uh, Wayside Cleanup doesn't get to give away money as often as some of the other programs that are um, getting to enjoy this, uh, if I could only do it. Uh, and then there, there's not, you know, in terms of kind of DEP moving ahead, uh, you know, we're all, you know, as a state, you know, obviously getting vaccinated and we're leading the country and all of that. Uh, so we don't have any news on when DEP will be going back into the offices. Um, we're kind of waiting word from uh, the secretary on, on the future of work and how that will uh, play in. Um, so we'll see, my, my bets are still that uh, we'll be working primarily from home uh, at least until uh, the beginning of September and, but there'll be more flexibility for, for staff to kind of do, uh, come into the office or certainly go out and do inspections and that sort of thing. Um, I know at, at least, the commissioner has, you know, has has gotten out of his basement uh, as well over the past week or so, uh, and uh, and is readjusting to actually making personal appearances uh, every once in a while, uh, which you know he finds strange. I think I will find it strange when I, I get out of my basement, but I think we're slowly, slowly coming out of of hybrid of our exile, I guess, not hibernation, we've been working. Um, and, you know, but we, we don't know, you know, any of the details of how this is going to work out going into the future. But so, yeah, seems to be working fine. Uh, and, you know, I think that's it, you know, usual site work going on. Um, you know, that's about it. So this is the part of office hours where you ask questions or bring up topics. I'd like to make a request that the first time we have an in-person Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee meeting in Boston, you serve food. Well, the LSPA could come through again. We used to patronize the Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah provide something. Yeah, well, you know, that's going to be interesting, though, on, you know, when we, when everybody starts getting Donuts will together. taste like bleach. But at, <laughs> at what point does food get reintroduced to all of this? Uh, yeah, the, the transfer of, of virus, you know, I, I think the, the whole you know, touching surfaces and obsessively cleaning things all the time. I, I think that's been discounted a bit. Um, although I, I did notice on, you know, watching one of the baseball games recently, I think down in Texas, the, the, 
the seats immediately behind home plate uh, at the stadium down there all had these big containers of uh, wipes, you know, right, <laughs> right where like the, the drink drinks would sit, but they all had you know, containers of wipes instead. Um, well, you could have individually wrapped cookies, people do. Yeah, you know, I I was thinking that when we go back, that you know, you're welcoming staff back by, you know, having um, you know French toast and, and bacon, uh, <laughs> as they get off the elevator, uh, which which of course, Nancy and Liz uh, and Ken will know uh, that is the me cooking bacon in the office has been banned, but oh no, but but that would be a fun thing to do. But I I think the you know the serving food. Um, uh, we'll have to get a ruling on that from the powers that be, but you know, individually wrapped stuff, yeah. But it takes the fun out of it if you're not making it yourself. But we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I, I think when, when we eventually get together some form of celebration and recognition yeah. uh, that we've, we've made over. it through would be appropriate and that it's, that it's over. Uh, and we are starting to think about, uh, this has come up a number of times, uh, in, including at, uh, I sat in on the uh, Commissioner's Advisory Committee uh, earlier this week, uh, and the kind of desire for um, kind of continued use of remote meetings in, as a way to uh, expand and, and continue accessibility uh, and kind of ease of participating in, uh, in these kinds of meetings. So you know, when we do get back together, we are going to have to kind of figure out ways of uh, also you know, simulcasting it, kind of like we did with the, the advisory committee meetings before, but in a way that would promote kind of more interaction with the people that are there and the people that are, are still online. Um, the way we were doing it before, kind of broadcasting the YouTube, it worked, but it was hard to get the, in, the direct interaction from the people that were watching online. That was, uh, we tried, but it was kind of clunky. Uh, so so we'll have, we'll have to figure out how to set things up and the cameras we'll need and, and all of that for, for doing this into the future. It's a new world, Paul. I don't know if you saw the news that New York City is not gonna have snow days anymore and days that you no know would be snow days and are gonna be- Yeah, well- about learning. We 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 certainly realized that this past this past winter, um, where it it was clear to us that um, you you we did not get to use the the weather related codes uh, on our timesheets uh, uh, for for snowstorms and things like that, unless unless you lost power and you, you couldn't actually log on to the internet, and then you got to use it. That was, we had that problem in Edom. The, the first snowstorm, there was no snow day. And the next, it was one of, I think it was the two day event or it took two days to clean it up. And there was big revolt by the staff and the teachers because great, there's no snow day. All my kids are home, but I also have to teach and, and other people. And so they decided there was, we had two snow days because it becomes a real problem for teaching school yeah for the teachers that also have small children so yeah that's going to be a problem in new york yeah yeah they'll they'll, they'll it will come <laughs> to some some new balance of figuring out how to do all of this stuff uh so in the chat is i posted the, stuff in the chat you want to keep that stuff so um, Connecticut Environmental Forum was yesterday, and Doug Pellin was announcing uh, that, that last week Mike Regan put together the new, there's a new abbreviation ECP for EPA Council on PFAS. Yeah. Deb Zaro. Deb Zaro. Yeah. So, so the question was, you know, with EPA Region 1 acting deputy, whatever, administrator, um, mm -hmm. Any uh, any involvement of uh, New England states or something in this uh, EPA Council on PFAS? Uh, nothing, certainly nothing formal. Uh, we're, we're certainly hoping that we'll have a little bit of an in uh, with Deb uh, sharing it. Um, uh, 
and and certainly feel a lot you know we have we have a lot of confidence in kind of her approach and her managing that process wow. uh, she was very helpful region one you know over the past few years as we've all been struggling with this and epa has been struggling with their own issues around around PFAS and kind of what the approach should be and how strongly to come out. Region one has been very supportive of, of us. And in cases like, for instance, at, that out at Devons where the town of Ayr was affected by, um, by the uh, DOD facility, uh, region one uh, was instrumental in getting DOD to step up and help the town with the treatment system and, and pay for it. Um, so, so it's good to see Deb doing that. And, you know, as uh, you know, she has the background for it and the knowledge and, you know, and if anybody is going to kind of take the lead on that, uh, Deb is a good person for it to happen. And then the the other link, the yes, Natick you know, may spend uh, three million to reduce PFAS in the town. Uh, of thinking about it, I don't think I don't did they need, did they vote yet? But yeah, well, there are a number of number of towns that are, um, are, are that are dealing with this, and you know the. I mean, it just it, you know it, it raises the question. So they're doing this because somebody they got twenty four and twenty one parts per trillion and water samples in Springvale and. So they're considering spending three million dollars to get it below twenty. You know, I, maybe Natick has no other need, and got to decide where you're going to spend your money. Right? Yep, and one one of the things that are, is important for the commissioner is uh, trying to find ways to help municipalities are, are are being hit by these unexpected costs and you know, unforeseen and unwanted costs. Uh, uh, whether it's, you know, Natick, uh, I think Wayland is in a, a similar situation fairly recently, uh, found uh, PFAS in their water supply. Uh, and there are a bunch of other, you know, I think it's up to 47 or so communities with greater than 20 parts per trillion in the water supply. So everybody is struggling with it in, in a lot of different ways. The you know, if, if a town is lucky, they have enough capacity and can shut down a particular well. Um, uh, other towns have fewer options for that. And so DEP is, is trying to work with them and they, uh, there's money available through the state revolving fund uh, to help out. Um, and the, I know the drinking water program is spending a lot of time you know, on technical assistance working with the various cities and towns on that. And to the extent that we can, uh, in ways I clean up, one of the things that you know, we look at is you know, whether like AIR and DOD, are there you know, sources that may be able to contribute to, to the treatment systems as well. So it's, this is one of the reasons why it is involving a lot of staff and a lot of resources and uh, yeah, that's where we spend a lot of our time, and particularly the regional staff. Um, How's the MWRA water? Is PFAS detected in that? MWRA water is 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 good. Um, I do not believe that it is detected. I think they were non-detect results. Um, or the analytes they looked for of the seven thousand. <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah, I, the the benefits of the you know, MWRA system is the the large sources and um, and fairly well protected sources. Um, well, I know Rhode Island is uh, one one of the concerns. Uh, Rhode Island gets a lot of Providence drinking water from the Situate Reservoir, so um, the concern is that public water supplies that come from reservoirs that are subject to atmospheric precipitation are considered more vulnerable than ones that come from wells. So I don't know if there's good evidence for that. But. Yeah, you know, I, there, there's so much work that still needs to be done on this. And, and you know, I, I haven't, you know, don't have the time to keep up on everything. Um, 
but I, I think in the grand scheme of things, uh, wells that are down gradient of uh, industries, facilities, uh, or places that used a triple F uh, on a kind of more routine basis, I, I think they are far more at risk than hmm. atmospheric uh, deposition. You know, I, I I think there's a, there is a difference, um, and you know some of the things that we see are uh, people you know pointing to for uh, some of the contamination that's out there. Things like atmospheric deposition, and I'm sure that that contributes some you know, to the surface water bodies, to the soil, and all of that. Uh, there, there's the work that we've been doing and others on the PFAS that are in that have gotten into the pesticides that are sprayed for uh, um, PFAS for that sort of the triple A. And, and that those, you know, we believe, and you know, I think the evidence is mounting that a lot of that uh, is coming from some of the containers uh, and that switching out of the containers, like the Anvil 10 plus 10, uh, the manufacturers switch to stainless steel tanks, I believe, instead of the uh, fluorinated um, plastic containers. Uh, and, and yes, certainly the, the level, you know, that contributes something. But I think people do have to take a step back and, and look at kind of what you know, what are the major contributing sources, and I think some of that might yield detectable levels. But I'm not sure that atmospheric deposition to reservoirs that anybody has you know, showed that it's coming anywhere close to 20 parts per trillion, um, and in causing the exceedances of the MCL that that we're seeing. And I, I don't think the, the levels that we've been talking about in the mosquito spraying uh, come anywhere close to, you know, in the end, in being detectable in the reservoirs, uh, given the kind of the spraying volumes and all of that. So there are these continuing sources, and where you have, where they become important, they they do become important. Uh, but I think it's more localized than than significant across the state. But, you know, more study may, you know, change my mind about that. Uh, but I, I think, think, I think now it's focusing more on land sources and, you know, direct discharges one way or another, rather than kind of the things that contribute to low, to background, but still at low levels. I think I'd be more worried about Anvil 10 plus 10 in my well, I mean, it is it is a pesticide. It's there for a purpose. I, I don't know what the you know how how any of the details of Anvil or any of the pesticides, but uh, but the the PFAS part of it is a small a small piece of that. Um. So our focus has been more on you know, more immediate kind of clearer sources. I think. More significant sources. All of that coming from Natick spending three million dollars <laughs> on their water uh, potential and the water supply. I have a question on DEP risk assessment guidance. Uh, okay, Joe. Yes. Hi. Uh, apologies if you discussed this recently. I kind of been in and out in these calls. I think on the last advisory committee meeting, you mentioned that. Uh, will be a revision to the DP risk guidance. <clears throat> I was wondering if you could give any more detail or background on that. It's pretty exciting. You know, it's a pretty big guidance document. Um, you know, issue 95, 96, I kind of view it as holding up pretty well over time. I'm assuming that some of the revisions are coming from proposed changes to the MCT, but I'm just wondering if you can give any additional background on, you know, what's, what's in mind for those changes to the risk guidance. I Sure, with the kind of caveat that you know this is all very general. Uh, the the changes in the details. Um, uh, Nancy Bettinger in our Office of Research and Standards uh, kind of is is and will be kind of leading that. Uh, yeah, I, I it in general, yeah, it has. I, I think it has held up well over time, uh, which is one of the reasons why it hasn't been. You know, there's been less pressure to update it. 
Um, but certainly, I mean, the obvious things um, uh, from the proposed reg changes, uh, uh, thing, things like calculation of exposure point concentrations and um, you know, looking at including more, more detail on calculating 95% upper confidence limits on the means and things like that. Uh, what, what was the, the sampling um, strategies? See, my mind is completely shot on, uh, my memory is bad. Um, the sampling strategy where you take a lot of, you know- Integrated sampling in integrated, methodology. Yes, thank you. Nancy Bettinger, great presentation. Why don't we hear more about ISM? Okay. Right, right, ISM. So, the, you know, the in, in incorporating more detail about ISM into the guidance document, how and when it's appropriate, uh, how to use it. You know, that would be great. Those sort of things um, would be part of that. So the, I, I think the, the bones of it are probably still um, pretty good, but the kind of providing more guidance, you know, if you're doing ISM, what would we uh, kind of like to see as part of that? Um, you know, the, there's detail and changes to the regs that would uh, need to be incorpor incorporated or at least recognized in the guidance. So, and I think what we talked about with the advisory committee meeting is uh, kind of Nancy has been working on Kind of preparing some initial drafts of different sections and that uh, when they're ready and when uh, kind of it's appropriate in terms of COVIDs and meetings and things like that, she, she'll start talking with the uh, external stakeholders on, on it and get some feedback that way, but have giving, giving people something to react to. Thanks. Uh, Matt has a link for uh, just, uh, uh, my friend Pat McIsaac from Test America or whatever. So they started a series back in February, which went from like the basics, but they're going to get into like, I think analytical is this month and they're all free. So, okay. Yep, there, there, there's a lot of, you could spend much of your day going to sure. PFAS webinars and Maybe. seminars. Um, IPRC alone. And, 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 and somebody should be doing it. Um, you know, our, our staff, uh, your staff, uh, you know, if I were just starting out uh, in the industry again, you know, I, PFAS certainly would be a good way to spend a lot of your time kind of, uh, not literally, but figuratively soaking it in uh, because we're gonna be dealing with this, this, you know, a lot. And from the, the range of different things that uh, somebody new in the the industry could get into, you know, from the practical app, you know, the, the site assessment kind of work, the, the forensics work, the treatment technologies, uh, and just the basic research of, you know, how it moves in, in the environment, where it's coming from. Uh, there's so much there that you could still, you know, even a few years into it, you know, it, it's still pretty much the ground floor and there's so much so much opportunity. So all of those kids coming out of college have so much to look forward to. Yeah. That's what's going to put them through college. But... Yeah, I, I tried to get my my son interested in it, but uh, nope, nope. He's more Well, in... but there's the, the other thing is the announcement came out uh, last week, this week. So on a course that you'll be involved in, Mr. Locke, so another aspect, speaking of PFAS risk, there's another aspect. There's the whole PFAS communication. Aspect. How do you talk about, about PFAS? Yes. How do you talk about the risk of PFAS when the risks are unknown? How do you communicate the risk of PFAS when the risks are not known? So yep. uh, experts in arm waving will be standing up in front of you on screen and <laughs> explaining. And, and when the experts disagree, uh, and it and yeah, it, it does. Yeah, you could you could take PFAS out of it and just have your know, chemical X. You don't know much about it. How do you how do you deal with it? How do you regulate it? How much risk are you willing to to take? And 
Well, in particular, I mean, again, just going towards what the department's doing, testing private wells, right? I mean, you're, you're asking people to sample their private wells, okay? We want to sample for this stuff, which you've never heard of, and, you know, well, okay, what, what's, do people ever ask the department? Like, you know, well, well, what, what's the bad, you know, what is it doing to me? What, why are we looking for this? They, they if, ask, I, if, if I've they been drinking, ask, you ask happen? people, they do ask people like us when we're out there and trying to sample dozens right. of wells in a community. So we, we have to give the best available information at the time. And yeah, so that's why we tried to throw this course together, Dave, was to try to help people like us who, you know, and Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner or whoever say, you know, what the heck, what is this all about? Well, yeah, does I think. Tell me, does it turn my hair green? It's like, what? We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, in in this in these ways, the the private well sampling project that we're working on is actually somewhat easier because since you know, people are coming to us, uh, you know, there's they may they may have misinformation about PFAS. They they may have limit or probably limited information about PFAS, but at least they they have enough to be curious or concerned. Um, and and want to have the well sampled. It it's a different challenge, and you know, I think David, it, well, you all deal with this, but uh, of going to a neighborhood where you know there has been, you know, a couple wells affected, and now you're going around and trying to convince everybody else, and this is the first that they've heard of it, <laughs> and you're going to them knocking on their door, um, is a, a a completely different animal. And, and not to extend this conversation too far, but and having a homeowner say, "Oh, I'm putting my house on the market next week. What do I do?" <laughs> like, what would you recommend, David? <laughs> exactly. It's like, well, then you should not delay our task. <laughs> and in this in this real estate market, I feel like there's quite a few people who are in that boat. Yep. Yep. So anything non PFAS? Are there other chemicals that are of interest out there? Well, I, I have a question, Paul. Yes, uh, we have a site where we have a lot of indoor air data with a variety of VOCs. Individually, the VOCs that below the applicable threshold value. The question is, is that sufficient to say that you don't need to do a method three risk characterization, either via the short form or you know a full method three by a toxicologist? And the and the verbiage that we're kind of hung up on is it says that if you're below the TVs, that it's unlikely to be of concern under current site conditions and whether that means that you don't have to look at the cumulative effect. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm going to give my opinion and then we'll see. Uh, if Liz and Gerard might have something different. Um, I, I think the point of the threshold values and the, the screening criteria is, uh, is, is to do that kind of screening. And in general, and stepping away from specifically indoor air, but in general DEP when setting chemical specific values, we, we set those at levels that are typically below what we would be concerned about for our cumulative risk limits. And part of the reason that we do that, so like the method one standards are targeted at uh, excess lifetime cancer risk per chemical of one in a million, whereas the cumulative risk limit is one in a hundred thousand specifically because we recognize that you could have multiple chemicals uh, that you're exposed to either in soil or groundwater or indoor air, for instance. Uh, and by setting those individual target levels less than the cumulative risk limits, we are indirectly uh, taking into account the potential cumulative effect. Uh, in many cases, I, I think what we see is there's you know, at sites where there is contamination, we tend to have you know one or two chemicals that drive the risk, and everything else is a, a little bit less. Um, it's 
I, I think it would be rare or uncommon to have you know, 12 chemicals right at their method one standard or right at their screening value um, so that the cumulative risk would be at or slightly above the cumulative risk limit. Uh, not impossible, but un un unlikely to have it. So, so I think setting those target levels lower to take that into account uh, is one way that the threshold screening levels would uh, indirectly address the cumulative risk issue. Um, for non-cancer as well as cancer? Uh, for non-cancer, it's at, typically at a hazard index of 0 0.2, so 20%, whereas the cumulative non-cancer risk limit is hazard index of one. So a factor of five. So, so I think Ha that that's the point of having the, the threshold values or you know whatever the screening values are in, in order to kind of do that process and, and say as long as they're below the threshold values and particularly with indoor air some of those threshold values if I'm remembering correctly are set at background levels rather than the risk-based levels which you know, changes the risk equation but the fact that they're set at background levels also tells you something. So Gerard is kind of nodding his head. So so is Liz. Yeah. <laughs> well, your your head is right beside mine uh, on my screen. I would just I would just add big. that it's a multiple line of evidence approach. So it would have also depend on. Um, I don't know what other sampling you've done there, but the thing that comes to mind uh, for me is the, the section two of the guidance that has the matrix, matrices for residential and commercial and, and pulling together multiple lines of evidence for making that decision. But I'm assuming you've already referred to that, Joel. Yeah. And one of the things that kind of up is that it says a method three risk characterization is required when vapor intrusion into a building is demonstrated to be a pathway con of concern as described in section 2.2. And we know we definitely have vapor intrusion. The question is, is it significant or not? And based on the TVs, it's not, but we definitely know we have vapor intrusion. We're all pretending to be frozen. Yeah. <laughs> well, That's kind this of is being yeah. recorded, Joel, so you'll <laughs> use this in your evidence. This will be your line of evidence. Yeah. Well, thankfully, I'm not the LSP on this project, but I, I, I was, I was faulting on the side of doing a method three, at least with the short forms. Um, yeah, know. the TVs aren't a risk characterization; they're an indicator of whether um, it's a pathway of concern. Yeah. And that was my argument, is that even though we're below all the TVs, in my opinion, we should do a method three just to be sure. And Gerard agrees. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any, any other questions, topics? Okay, get, get, getting back to what Elliot said about when we all get back together in person, I thought he was gonna recommend that we all come with virtual background strapped to our back so we could identify who we are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would, uh, I that work would, for food, so. <laughs> virtual food. Yeah, virtual food. <laughs> We could all bring our own food and eat together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think by the time we, we actually get back to having some in-person meetings like this, the, the, they'll let us eat. Because uh, I, I, I think certainly DEP is um, going to be very cautious and uh, kind of slow to reinstitute things like that, that are not absolutely necessary. You know, 
the first things we'll be doing um, are making sure we get out and do inspections and uh, and audits and getting out into the field and the the direct face to face meeting stuff, um, which can be done remotely, probably will continue to be done remotely for a while. And then I, I don't know if the, we're we're all kind of waiting for the future of work, and I say that with a capital F and a capital W, our uh, kind of project to start bearing fruit, and we start seeing kind of what the state actually views our. Uh, it's kind of how we're going to do business going into the future, and you know, they they may take our our big conference rooms away, they may disappear, um, and they may restructure our entire offices. Um, so, well, I put the link to the double three in the chat in case that's the way you want to go. A double three, yes, uh, a segue oh. with an iPad on a stick. Yeah, well, well, you guys may remember my um, my AV cart with the big, <laughs> big TV monitor on it and the the video camera. So it was it it needed somebody to push it, so it didn't move around like that by itself. But yeah, that would be cool. So, uh, okay, well. Right. Uh, on on that note, as we're all going to be just iPads on a stick uh, going into the future, uh, if there's nothing else, we'll we'll do this again next week. I don't think there's any conflicting stuff on the schedule. Um, what is next week? The thirteenth. Okay, Thursday the thirteenth. So. Have a good week. Have a good weekend. Uh, oh, remember, it's Mother's Day. Oh, thank Monday. you, Paul. Yes. Uh, I have to keep reminding my kids. Okay. You, can, you can't take mother out to dinner this year. It's not easily. So. Uh, no, we're, we're going up to Maine, and the child up there is responsible for making reservations somewhere or figuring out how to feed us. So it's... Uh, it will be interesting to see what he comes up with. Have a wonderful time. I'm, I'm just along for the ride. Yeah. You're the plus one. I'm the plus one, yeah. <laughs> okay, see you all next week. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you, Paul. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.